Hello again. This is the adult Sunday school lesson for Sunday, September the 5th, 2021. It's entitled Fairness. It's taken from the book of Proverbs. I'm going to be uh, going through a presentation that uh, would be suitable for my class, which is called the Praxis class, adult Sunday school class for men and women. But any uh, Sunday school teacher might find uh, resources or information that would be useful to their own Sunday school or individual study. The lesson in the, uh, in the quarterly, the Connections Quarterly, is entitled Living Wisely, and it uh, is taken from the uh, biblical wisdom books, Old Testament books of the Bible. Today it's entitled Fairness from the book of Proverbs. Next week it will be on knowledge, character follows that, and courage. So these four topics go into the living wisely uh, lesson for, for this month of September. Uh, we're going to be looking at four characteristics of living faithfully as God's people, which basically consists of just treatment for those who are poor. And we're going to, in, to explore the character of woman wisdom, sometimes called Sophia, that is uh, a characteristic of the scriptures. And we'll be looking at concept or of uh, what is the ideal woman or good person, a good and strong wife, concrete images from the book of Proverbs and Esther. We'll be looking at Esther as a role model of courage. So this is what we will be dealing with over the next few weeks. When we look at wisdom, wisdom is defined in various ways. It's generally the ability to contemplate and act. So we can say that a person is wise as they put knowledge into action. So it is a sum of knowledge, experience, understanding, common sense, and insight. There's also attributes associated with wisdom, such as unbiased judgment, compassion, uh, knowing oneself. Some of the ancient Greek philosophers, Plato, Aristotle, and others were big on knowing yourself first as a precondition for being able to get along well in the world. And we need to be able to get beyond ourselves and uh, not have just personal attachment to the things we're looking at, but be able to look objectively at a situation. Wisdom also includes virtues such as ethics and benevolence. So it's not just a simple concept of knowing facts or being able to uh, recite the alphabet or all the presidents or all the, the months of a year, but it's using those facts in a way that's helpful to you and to society. There are various aspects of wisdom that uh, have come uh, through our religious art through the years. Uh, Abigail was known in the Bible as a uh, helper and a wise woman to King David. Here's a woodcut that exemplifies Abigail interacting with King David. And uh, frequently we hear that Solomon was the wisest person ever, or certainly a wise king. And here's a woodcut that shows uh, Solomon interacting with uh, the, the personification of divine wisdom in this woman. Uh, in addition to Solomon's 700 wives and 300 concubines, perhaps his most important uh, consort was with a person or with God's spirit that uh, produced wisdom in him. I'm so grateful for Daryl Elster, who has brought to our attention to this, these wonderful publications from uh, BibleProject.com. I have, a, have all of these for every book of the Bible. It's such a, a, an interesting one-sheet summary of all the books of the Bible. Here's the one for Proverbs. There are 21 chapters in the book of, or excuse me, 31 chapters in the book of Proverbs. And in the beginning chapters, we're dealing with uh, 10 speeches from a father to a son, how to be wise in the world. We're dealing with the moral logic of Proverbs. Uh, there are many one-liners and many stories that depict 
how to be successful in the world. And uh, so it's truly a, a wonderful resource and I encourage you to look it up under uh, bibleproject.com and you'll find a useful introduction. I mean, these are wonderful uh, examples and pictures. I'm a picture learner myself. I, I can see something better and understand it if uh, I can visualize it. And so this uh, bibleproject.com series is, is very useful in that regard. Here is a, a, some background information about the book of Proverbs. It's called wisdom literature. Uh, there's no plot, no stories, no characters, also no theology. Uh, that's why uh, when I had a, a at work Bible study a few years ago when I was still working, all of us who were Christian could use the book of Proverbs as a morning Bible study source because it didn't focus on any one doctrinal point or uh, story, idea or theological idea that, that others might agree with and some might disagree with. So it's really a, a, a useful book in all contexts. It comes from the process of Israelite men passing along wisdom to those that they were grooming for positions of responsibility. There was a particular group of wise men or counselors, much like priests or prophets, and they were considered wise people for uh, to help those who were growing up in the uh, in the Jewish faith. Kind of like CPAs and counselors, and you know, you get business consultants to come in to help you run a business that share their their wisdom. Well, these these wise counselors in Israel did the same for uh, for the children of Israel. So here's a typical example of one of the Proverbs from chapter 21, which is near our, uh, our lesson today is in chapter 22, but it says, it's better to stay outside on the roof of your house than to live inside with a nagging wife. <laughs> that is a bit sexist, but many of the Proverbs point to w wise women as well. But you can see they have kind of a, uh, a memorable aspect to them. Uh, in fact, many of the Proverbs deal with sex and are too racy, really, to be read in a public worship service. So having said that, you'll probably want to bring down your, your copy of Proverbs and read them from, from first to last. Uh, but I, some of them I can't imagine that uh, our pastor would stand in the pulpit and even read to us but they're a wise counsel for us as we're out into the world. There's an influential professor at uh, Southern Baptist Seminary, Clyde T. Francisco, who taught Old Testament. And uh, I have his book, and uh, he classifies the book of Proverbs as a poetical book. You know, so there are various ways to classify scripture. Uh, Proverbs, uh, according to our lesson writer, is uh, seen as a book of wisdom, which includes Job, Ecclesiastes, and Proverbs. Uh, but it can also be called a poetic book, along with Job, Psalms, Ecclesiastes, Song of Songs, and Lamentations. So we have the idea that the form that something takes is associated with its content. But uh, the content of these uh, wisdom literature is how to be wise in the world, useful pointers of information. Uh, but it's not straight declarative prose. It's written in a poetic style that emphasizes uh, and repeats itself. So various ways to look at it, but we'll be looking at it from both its content and its form. Uh, as I said, our lesson writer classifies Proverbs as a wisdom books, including Job and Ecclesiastes. And when we talk about poetical books, biblical poetry features accented stress, usually three beats to the line, and parallelism. Now, in English poetry, we put words together that rhyme. Once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered weak and weary. So you get those words rhyming at the end of a line. We say, oh yeah, that's poetry. Well, not so with Hebrew wisdom poetry, their rhyming has to do with the meaning. And you'll find that 
you'll be one, two, or three or more sentences that say about the same thing. That is how they mean by rhyming. So sometimes the second line will repeat the first line, but with slightly different words. And we'll call that synonymous parallelism. Sometimes the second line will be different from the first line and it will be opposite of, we'll call that antithetical or opposite. And sometimes the second or third rendering in these wisdom statements carry on or increase in magnitude or meaning in kind of a crescendo of meaning. So that is one of the keys for understanding Hebrew poetry is looking at its form and content. Is it being repeated exactly the same way, in an opposite way, or is it creating a crescendo effect? So I, these scribes were much like counselors, and the wisdom is closely associated with kings of uh, Solomon and Hezekiah. So these are official pronouncers of wisdom and not so much individual wisdom that you would get from an individual father or mother, but more village wisdom that goes into making up the nation. So there are three sources or three witnesses to the text of Proverbs. The oldest one goes back to the Hebrew language and uh, it's in the Hebrew Bible. There was a later Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures called the Septuagint and uh, which dates from kind of the intertestamental period. Doesn't go back to the ancient Hebrews but was a, a translation, a modern rendering of the Greek, of the Hebrew language into a Greek language. And then there's a third witness that has only been discovered in the, the 20th century with the uncovering of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And uh, I have a copy of that as well. I like to compare and contrast the three versions of these Old Testament writings. And in fact, the Dead Sea Scrolls, we have portions of Proverbs 1, 2, 13, 14, and 15. We don't have a, a Dead Sea Scroll representing our, uh, our scripture today, however, from chapter 22. Solomon, if you ask just a, a lay person, uh, or general student about, well, who wrote the Proverbs? An easy answer is to say Solomon. However, uh, he's probably not the literal author it, there, there was a Hebrew pattern after the exile for their scholars to get together and assemble similar types of writings and ascribe them to a particular person. So uh, nowadays uh, we now think that the writings and information that pertains to the law or Torah, they lump together and, and included under the writings of Moses. Many of the Psalms were lumped together included under the writings of David, and many of the Proverbs then were lumped together and associated with Solomon. But according to King Solomon, wisdom is gained from God. Now, here's an example of the parallelism I was talking about. The first sentence says, for the Lord gives wisdom. Simple enough statement. And then the second parallel reading of that is, from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. That's a synonymous saying. The second sentence is saying about the same thing in slightly different words. Here's an example of crescendo parallelism. And through God's wise aid, one can have a better life. He holds success in store for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk, whose walk is blameless, for he guards the course of the just and protects the way of the faithful one. So you see, the first part of it goes a certain distance, but then the amplifying parallel statements go beyond that and produce even greater wisdom or greater knowledge. So we're to trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. First statement, second statement, in all your ways submit to him and he will make your paths straight. What would you call that? Looks to me like synonymous parallelism. But that's the example of poetry in the Old Testament. So, with the wisdom one receives from God comes success and happiness in life. That's the basic idea of Proverbs. So let us look at some scripture. 
I'm going to read this from the quarterly and then uh, summarize and have some uh, comments about these verses in the presentation. But Proverbs 22, 1 to 2 says, A good name is to be chosen rather than great riches, and favor is better than silver or gold. The rich and the poor have this in common. Quote, the Lord God Yahweh is the maker of them all. So, verse 1 says, having a good name is more valuable than silver or gold. I wonder if we would agree with that. That uh, Certainly, uh, if you're being slandered, you might, uh, you might think, yeah, give me my good name back. Or if you ever lose your good name, people don't think highly of you. It's very hard to get that back, no matter how wealthy you would be. But one thing rich and poor have in common is that Yahweh, the Lord, made them all. In the text, you'll see that uh, the name, the word Lord, L-O-R-D, is presented in all capital letters. And when that occurs in our English translations of the, script, of the Old Testament scripture, that indicates that in the text appears the great name of God, or Yahweh. And that's different when Lord is in upper and lower case letters. The great name of, of God, Yahweh, does not appear in those. But here, the writer is saying that Yahweh has created rich and poor, and, and he is the father of us all. So there is no guarantee that a good name leads to riches, for even a good person might live in poverty and struggle to survive. That's one of the unfairnesses of, the, of life. The title of the lesson is Fairness, and sometimes life is basically unfair. Some people who prosper don't deserve to prosper, and some people who are, aren't prospering have put in diligent effort but are not reaping the results of it. It's hard to see from the heavenly perspective what results in prosperity for some and poverty for others. But the Old Testament concept of poor, poor refers to those who have no advocate and are vulnerable to neglect and mistrust. This would include the blind, the hungry, sick, widows and orphans, and, and foreigners, aliens who are uh, traveling through their country. But financial poverty is just one aspect of their experience. It's possible to be poor in understanding, poor in ability, uh, poor in other ways other than just not, in ha not having the means uh, to provide food. So wisdom comes from God. Wisdom is tied to justice and fairness. And fairness is really at the heart of the Old Testament commitment to justice. You know, a just God, Yahweh, wants everybody to have equal access to the foundations of life. And so that concept of fairness spills over to followers of Yahweh who are to provide, to provide that for themselves and others. Fairness is not about having everyone having the same thing or the same amount. That's not what fairness is. Fairness is about everyone having what they need to live. You know, we're not dealing with extravagance or way beyond subsistence level. The Old Testament concept of fairness that we're looking at today means that at least people will have the ability to make it from day to day. If they don't have that, then we should be helping them to get it. Caring for the poor is a godly and wise endeavor. And in fact, the laws of the children of Israel were such that they, they did not glean 100% all the acreage they left the stubble and uh, for others, the widows, and foreigners, who had no other means of support. And uh, various uh, teachers' statements of wisdom from Yahweh is that Yahweh favors those who favorably deal with those who are oppressed. So that's one aspect of, of wisdom. Another aspect is generosity, which is in our second scripture reading in Proverbs 22, 8 and 9. Whoever sows injustice will reap calamity and the rod of anger will fail. Those who are generous are blessed 
for they share the bread with the poor. Now this is a par an example of the opposite or antithetical parallelism in these verses. Whoever sows injustice will reap bad calamity and the rod of anger will fail. But those who are generous and blessed by sharing bread with the poor, uh, which is the basic definition of generous, bread means life. They're, we are dealing with the essentials, not secondary aspects of life. When they share that with others, they are deemed blessed. So wise people do not just share their bread with those who have none, although that's a good first step. They work to change the systems and policies that contribute to poverty. So, you know, that, that's a challenge for us. You know, how do we go about supporting causes uh, and laws and support that help those who are disadvantaged systemically? Not just providing immediate relief, but more long-term relief. And truly wisdom comes from God. I mentioned before some of the ancient Greek philosophers like Aristotle, Socrates, say that it all starts with knowing yourself. Uh, one of our 20th century science fiction writers, Isaac Asimov, says that one of the saddest aspects of life right now is that science gathers knowledge faster than society gathers wisdom. Sometimes we don't use the knowledge that we have in ways that benefit us directly. And uh, I guess the wisest person, one of the wisest who ever lived, at least from a sec technical and scientific point of view, would be Albert Einstein. And he says, any fool can know, the point is to understand. So knowledge and wisdom implies more than just surface level, being able to quote a fact, but being able to look beyond the surface and see uh, causal relationships, governing dynamics, and how we participate in uh, bringing about a better world of fairness to all. So then we'll end by looking at the third uh, portion of scripture, which is a little bit longer. See if you can, uh, it, it, it's two verses. It, it, it's, uh, it's about the same uh, length as the others. It, it, it's not longer, but it says, in verse 22, do not rob the poor because they are poor, or crush the afflicted at the gate. For the Lord pleads their cause and despoils of life those who despoil them. Now this is an example of a crescendo or synthetic parallelism because the second verse there carries the thought to an even greater extent. The first verse just it says, don't rob the poor or crush the afflicted at the gate. Because, again, Yahweh, the great name of God, Yahweh, will plead their cause and they will, he will bring vengeance and justice to those that mistreat them. So God is the source of retribution and knowledge in a just world. Very important concept in Old Testament scripture that uh, if the just are suffering for righteousness sake, God will vindicate them. If not in this world, then in the world to come. Very key concept that took a lot of years to catch on, but it's a key thought and I appreciate our lesson writer bringing that to our attention. But just because someone is poor, for whatever the reason, whether they, they deserve it or not deserve it, others don't have a right to crush them or steal from them God's righteousness includes the just treatment of all people, especially those at risk. So as you structure your class and think about how to apply this, here are some questions that come to my mind. Proverbs 22.4 states that humility and fear of the Lord result in riches, generally, honor and life. Why then do some good folks live in poverty? Is it because of poor choices they're making? Are they just bad luck? Is God bringing vengeance on them? These are difficult questions. There are many books. Why do good things, why do bad things happen to good people? I don't know. 
I don't think God intends any of his creatures to experience bad, to live in poverty. And a sense of fairness would say, as we have access, we should open up and present that to others. How exactly, here's another good question from our lesson today, how exactly does one go about acquiring a good name? Or how does one lose it? I've had seminars in this when I was working in the world before I retired, and one of the key concepts that I learned was our life works, people think well of us to the extent that we keep our commitments. So that, for me, has been step one, that if you make a commitment, keep it, live up to it, don't weasel out, don't not do it, don't go against your word. Sometimes changes are inevitable, but there's an adult way to confront that and deal with it rather than just letting it slide. So if a good name is to be valued more than riches, one of the ways that we keep our good name is to keep our commitments. And another question that would bring about a lot of discussion if we had others present would be, what are some of the ways that corruption derails justice? You know, justice seeks to provide for those who are afflicted and uh, are in need, but sometimes corrupt people, corrupt systems don't help uh, where help is needed. And so we need to be ever aware of that and vigilant. Maybe you have answers to these questions that you could share with your class. I hope so. So thank you for joining me today. Remember, don't take me too seriously. I'm just one person presenting what I think are reasonable solutions, uh, reasonable interpretations of the scripture. Disclaimer, I am a well-intentioned amateur only. You'd be well off to check my facts. Go to the uh, bibleproject.com, read the quarterly, read the scripture. Read what other resources you have. One of the beautiful things of our Sunday school class is we share our prayer concerns. Uh, we always end our session with remembering those that we have mentioned for prayer. And the prayer needs are, are lengthy. So uh, I hope to see you next week. And I want to give a special shout out and thank you to Daryl, who is our First Baptist Church. I'm calling him a technical wizard. I hope he's not offended by that title. He produces and records these sessions. He could be on this side of the camera as well, but he can't be in two places at the same time. So check out my, my resources. Broadman commentary is always useful. You can get at a low cost some of these other introduction to the Bible, survey of the Bible. There's a Francisco's introducing the Old Testament. Dead Sea Scrolls available for $20. What a bargain. I also use other, other books when we're into the New Testament. So uh, there's never been a better time for Bible study because of the availability of such rich resources. So thank you very much for your time this time, and I hope to see you next week.